Good morning. Thanks for joining us. We continue our series today, The World That God Intended. And I was just reading through a book by uh, Jerry Sitzer, and I came across what was the genesis of this series in my own mind. And that was just something about uh, how to fix the world. How, it was an old Jewish expression. And it was just kind of cool to think back, oh, that was the idea that prompted me to go down this vein. Well, last week we looked at our broken world, but in the God's not surprised. He knew that things were going to go awry. He was not shocked by it. But we also see that beauty and love shine all the more in a broken world. How many of you remember pre- Pre-disco BJ's, BJ's, BGs, the BGs, the Brothers Gib. Yeah. So if you remember, if you remember them before Saturday Night Fever and before they went disco, you're old because that was a long time ago. But there's this one song by them. How can you mend a broken heart? I mean, it's a poignant song, and I heard a live version of it on iTunes, and the crowd is just going wild over the the vocals. I won't do the vocals, but if you remember, you you, you get it. So, how do you mend? A broken heart. Well, here's another one. How do you get the toothpaste back in the tube? Some things are not easy to do. If you're God, how do you mend a broken world? Seriously, how do you mend this broken relationship with your creation? He chose not to wipe the whole thing out. We'll touch on that in a little bit. But we go back to the, the Garden of Eden. And we find out that, that you've got Adam and Eve, and they eat the fruit they're not supposed to eat. And now they're hiding from God. I was just doing a, a Bible study this, this past week uh, in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, at the end of the world, people are hiding from God. I want you to think about how that, that feels. In just a minute, we're going to read the passage of Scripture that it comes from. I'm going to tell you a reaction that I had to it this week. But I think it had to break the heart of God. How could God get us out of hiding? And how could God mend a broken world without messing our free will? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak to each person who hears this today, whenever, wherever. And you know that's one of the the disconcerting things, but also one of the exciting things of almost this past year now, is that, that, that words reach further than they used to. Touch people. I pray that, that you would communicate your heart to your people for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am weary from the waves Crashing over every day God, mercy, please come rescue me. I am longing for your voice, gentle whisper in the noise. Father, tell me everything's alright. Your power, your presence breaks strongholds, King of Heaven. When you speak, mountains move. I believe there will be breakthrough. You alone can take my scars, piece by piece, restore my heart. Take what's broken, make it whole again Your power, your presence Breaks strongholds, King of Heaven When you speak, mountains move I believe Open the heaven 
Almighty God, you are overcomer, defender of my heart. To you I got a woe, and by your power, the oceans open wide. Almighty Father, heaven and earth collide. King Jesus, forever by my side. Shake the mountains, break the walls apart, open the heavens, almighty God you are, overcome, defender of my heart. And by your power, the oceans open wide, your fire falls down, heaven and earth collide, King going to begin the message today kind of at the beginning. Well, not exactly the beginning of the Bible, but Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 1 will actually reference a little bit later in the message. But here, Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat of. And then, after eating it, they felt shame because they were naked. And so they took fig leaves to make little garments for themselves. And I, I had a preacher I used to know that uh, he said that fig leaves are really rough, and so it was a really bad choice. It was definitely a bad choice. You wouldn't want fig leaf underwear. But I want to read these next couple verses, verses 8 and 9 in chapter 3, and, and my reaction to them when I read them yesterday. I've read them probably a hundred times. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord called to the man, where are you? I was reading that and I read that, it, that they hid. And you get the idea that there's this pattern that God would come and visit. He would just walk with them in the garden and he would, he would be with them. And I cried. I mean, I've read this a hundred times, but yesterday it's like I got it from God's perspective. Here's his the, the pinnacle of his creation. Everything else is just going to do its thing because the mountains do what they do. The sea does what it does. A giraffe does what it does. And they have instincts. But human beings he created to be in relationship with himself. To Everything else glorifies him. But we would have a choice in the matter. And there's a relationship. And now they're hiding. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it was like to be that close to God and now to have this separation? And it doesn't matter whether it was junior high, high school, college, or it was last year. The simple beauty of being with someone who wants to be with you. Now, I, I could tell you stories from, from high school, from, from college, but probably the safest thing and the best thing would just be, 
my wife. I like being with my wife. Sometimes it surprises her. Uh, it surprises me when she wants to be with me. But seriously, like, you know, if we travel, we, we just, we don't have to do a whole lot. There don't, doesn't need to be a ton of activities. I think we kind of like how each other think. It's a beautiful, simple thing when you're just with someone that you want to be with and you know that they want to be with you, right? I mean, that was the cheap trick song, right? I want you to want me. It's, it's simple, but it's profound. And that is what God wanted. That's what God wanted. So, how could God fix it? What could God do? How could he make this right? Well, you've got this broken relationship, and Adam and Eve, you know, they, just, they were guilt-tripped. And somehow they were able to pass that along through Adam's seed. And every person since has had this tendency to go, Oh, kind of my own way. And so much so that we even might think that we're honoring God, but sometimes we're, we're really not. So God started a relationship with an old guy. His name was Abram. Later he changed his name to Abraham. And he made promises to him. Like he promised him, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And <laughs> Abram's like, uh, I, I need one kid first, okay? And I don't have time to go into the whole story. But you know, the story of Abram... Abraham is a great story because it tells us that God makes promises and God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. He kept them to Abraham. He'll keep the promises he's made to you. So God could, could not throw away this world that he had made because there, were, there, were, there was endless potential. He knew that because he knew that how he created us and how special we were. So hundreds of years after that, Seems like he kind of forgot them, but he didn't. And these descendants of Abraham through Joseph, and they're, they're down in, in Egypt, okay? And they're slaves. So there's this guy, he's 80 years old, and he's kind of thinking, I'm on the downside of my life. His name was Moses, and he's on the lamp. He's running away because he's, he committed murder 40 years earlier. And then a bush starts chatting with him. And and he starts chatting back to the bush. I mean, it's one thing if you think a bush is talking to you, but when you start talking to the bush, something's going on there. And so God chooses the Israelites. I mean, he's telling Moses, I want to set my people free and all this stuff. Oh, wait a minute. Where, where do they get off being God's people? Would you choose the Israelites? They're a slave nation. If it was me, yeah, I'd pick the, the Egyptians. They got a much more advanced culture. They, they've got... They've got wealth, they've got prestige, they've, they've got a lot of things going for them. Isn't that something? God chooses this slave nation. God has a tendency, if you read the Bible, to love and, and, and favor the underdog. The person who doesn't seem to have a chance. Is that you today? Or maybe it's this one situation, I don't have a chance. Maybe you don't, but, but God does. And so... Another reason that he came for the children of Israel and he sent Moses was because he made promises to Abraham. And it didn't matter how big of a mess the descendants of Abraham were in. God made his promises and God fulfills his promises. Did, did you hear that right now? You, you have some promises from God. The Bible is filled with them. Once you receive Christ, once you're in the family, you, you've got all these, these promises. But you might find yourself in a mess. And maybe you made the mess, and maybe somebody else made the mess. But you're in a mess. But God doesn't forget his promises. God wants to get you out of the mess. I'm not saying there may not be some consequences. But God is going to get us out of the mess. We can trust in his promises. So Moses goes before Pharaoh, who is the most powerful man on earth. And he says, let my people go. <laughs> and I'm sure Pharaoh's just like, who brought... Who brought this sheep boy in here? What, wh why should I let your people go? Seriously, give me, give me, what's your leverage? <laughs> what, what are you going to use to, to get me to do this? And he's like, well, a bush was talking to me. I was talking to a bush. And I asked who it was and it said, I am who I am. And Pharaoh was just like, get, get this guy out of here. Well, you know the story. We don't have time to tell the whole thing. Um, but there was the plagues. And the deal was, 
Pharaoh was the most powerful man on planet Earth. In all likelihood at that time, they, they had a big kingdom going and he was powerful. But Moses represented the most powerful God in the universe. Not just on Earth, in the universe. There is no other God but him. And you know the story. Red Sea opens up. We're talking biblical proportions. I mean beyond Ghostbusters. Okay, we're talking biblical proportions. Now can you imagine being the Israelites? You're, you're a slave and then this, this dude... Moses comes along, and some people are like, didn't we hear, didn't he, wasn't he raised a prince or something? And he killed somebody, and now he's going to set us free? Yeah, fat chance, that's not going to happen. But it does. And so everything that they've known now is, is left behind, and they, they've got a million people on a camping trip with Moses. And Moses' big idea to them is, is well, let's go to Mount Sinai, because that's where I talked to God, that's, that's where I was talking to God through the bush before. So I want to take you there. So we can have like this mountaintop experience there at Mount Sinai. Do you think slaves, people who were raised in slavery, would be really trusting? I think they're like, so we're free, but where are we going? What's, what's the end game here? So they get to Mount Sinai and Moses says, I'll be right back. I'm going to go chat with God a little bit. And while he's up there, well, all Hecuba breaks loose. And that's a whole other story. But when he comes down... He's got the Ten Commandments, or in the original language, I like this in, the, in, uh, in Hebrew, he's got the Ten Words, and he's got them on two tablets. And, uh, and one, of those, one of those words was, thou shalt not murder. And I'm just imagining Moses coming down from the mountain with these tablets, reading them, and just thinking like, I wonder if God saw that thing I did a few years back. Because anyway, I mean, here he is delivering them, and he, he broke one of the big ones. God needed a people to reveal himself to, and then a people who would represent him. He's still doing that. Now he's doing it through the New Covenant. He reveals himself through Jesus Christ. He reveals himself through his word. He reveals himself through the Holy Spirit, who is present with us today, and it is as close as a heartbeat. And then he wanted the Israelites to represent him then, He's calling us to represent him today. Let's take a look at Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter uh, 20, where you will find the Ten Commandments. And we're going to read just the first few verses. Now, some of you right now are kind of like, oh, I'm not into the law. This, I, I don't want to feel guilty. I want to look at it, try to look at it through the eyes of these folks that just got brought out of slavery. Then God gave the people all these instructions or words. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. So that's, he's saying, this is who I am. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery. You must not have any other God but me. Okay. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I am the Lord your God. And I'm going to skip ahead to verse 6. I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Now some of, you know, we've heard these before, so I hope we can maybe get a fresh look at them today. The first thing God says is, who am I? I'm the God that rescued you. Yesterday you were a slave, today you're not. Do you get how that applies in, in the Christian realm? That yesterday you were a slave to sin, but today you're not. Yesterday you were guilty, but I paid the price for your sin. That's who I am. I choose you. That's what he's saying. I am your God. You belong to me. Now one of the things, uh, when I used to rent, one of, the things, one of the things I liked about having a landlord was, if the dishwasher broke, it's not my dishwasher. It's not my problem. So you just call the, the landlord, and then six to ten months later, it's taken care of. Hopefully, it's sooner than that. But that's the good news with having a landlord. If, if I belong to God, then my problems, well, my problems become his. He's the one that can, can solve them. And he says, you know, you saw all those gods down in Egypt? Now I'm your God. I am your God. I am yours. And he, I, I love this, and he says, you must have no other God but me. So... I'm not going to go into a lot of stories about dating, but it was in retrospect that I realized that probably since the time I was 16 years old, I didn't really date, I courted. What's the difference? I never pursued 
in general, I would say maybe one exception, maybe. I courted, what does that mean? If I didn't think the relationship was headed towards marriage or could possibly someday head towards marriage, then I wasn't just gonna just mess around. That's just, that's just kind of how I roll, okay? Uh, but I remember I was, I was dating somebody and it started to get a little bit more serious and then she said, well, I've got to give so-and-so a call. Well, who's so-and-so? Well, this other guy that I've been dating because now we're going to date exclusively. And I, was, I mean, I was just like, date exclusively. I never, you know, I didn't watch The Bachelor, The Bachelorette. I, I don't, neither does God. Well, maybe he does, but you get my point. To exclusivity, it's, it's like, so, Dating, years ago, there was somebody who came in for pastoral counseling. They were getting married, and our pastor, we'll call him Phil, was sitting down with this couple, and he was just saying how important it is to, to be together, and, and then he says, but after you get married, it's going to be important that you, that you date. And the, the bride-to-be heard him say that you guys have, like, date night, and that you guys continue to, to do things together and be intentional. The guy heard date other people, like not date exclusively. And this, he, he cannot figure out how his bride-to-be and his pastor are telling him, you should date other people. When they eventually all got on the same page, they, they had a good laugh. Um, but the point here is that God wants an exclusive relationship with us. Do you get that? Like, he created us. He wants, he wants this kind of relationship with us. Let me ask you something. Are you, are you in an exclusive relationship with God? Is there any, anybody else at his level? Is God really the center of your life? I, dwell on that. You know, take some time this week and just say, is God really the center of my life? You know, I like how Jesus put it in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, verse that probably a lot of you know, Matthew 6.33 says this. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek God and his kingdom above all else. And live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. And that's implied really in this statement we're just looking at. He's saying, I'm your God. I've already gotten you out of the house of Egypt. I will be there for you. Just Give me that spot in your life. That's what I wanted with Adam and Eve. But they, they messed that up. And when it says, I am the Lord your God, the word your is individual. It's not plural. So that means it's not just he's thundering this to Moses, but he's saying it to the person who's the slave, who's the youngest, who has the least status, whoever it is. I'm the Lord your God. And I hope some of you can really hear that today because sometimes we think, oh, other people, you know, God, God loves that person. But no, he's saying it to everyone, each and every one of you, not just Moses. And they were powerless. They were slaves. They were poor. They probably considered themselves losers. And God says, I am yours and you are mine. I hope you let that sink in as well. We're talking grace, and a lot of times we think Old Covenant, we, we don't see the grace. It's undeserved love, merit, and favor. Yahweh has the power to deliver us from our own personal Egypt. What's your personal Egypt? What's the thing that enslaves you? What's the thing that, that holds you back? You know, and it might be something that in, in your tapes, you know, you think about it. Think about the messages that these people, you know, received growing up. If you want to talk about tapes, well, they were raised as slaves. You know, it's a fascinating study to take a look at how different Moses and Aaron are. Well, one was raised as, as a prince of Egypt, and the other was raised as a slave. And I can fault Aaron, and, and I can marvel at Moses' leadership, but they, they were not dealt the same hand. They weren't. And some of you were dealt a hand much more like Aaron's, but God wants to rewrite the tapes. He wants to change the way we think. You don't belong to Egypt anymore. You belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. So what's all the stuff about idols and images and God's name in vain? And some of us are just like, takes me back to catechism or, you know, CCD or, or whatever it might be. And, and maybe it wasn't the best experience. But let's, let's just take a look. And I think there's some really cool stuff here. And there's plenty to go around as far as idols. No, you probably don't have like this little statue that you burn incense to and you, you bow down before. But I'll just sum it up. Money, sex, and power. 
sex, money, power, money, power, sex. Those powerfully are, I, I think, the, the huge idols of our age. And if I don't think I've given a shout out yet to Adam Hamilton. I'm reading, he's got a book that uh, deals with the Ten Commandments, and I definitely want to give him a shout out. I'm borrowing a number of things from, from him today. He told a story about a church that he thought had a little issue with idolatry. It was a, a small, quaint, kind of uh, country church, but there was like growth in the area, and there's all these new housing developments going in. So the bishop said, hey, have a building fund, we'll help you, put up a new building, you have all these people you can reach. Because they're probably not going to want to come to your old building because you don't even have indoor plumbing, you got an outhouse. And the people said, no, we like our building. I got married in this building. My son got baptized in this building. Th this is where I gave my life to Christ. I, I want to stay here. Well, it might all sound good, but they missed the opportunity to love the people of their community because they made that church an idol. One of the things I love about Ash Wednesday is it's the palm fronds from the, from the year before, the palm branches. They burn them so that our worship, even our good experiences from the year before, it's but dust. And it reminds us that we need a new and a fresh experience with God. But, you know, people like a God they can see. Right? And so I think that's why, you know, hey, let's face it. You talk about idols. You... you technology, there's all kinds of, of things around us, but people like something that they can see, something sometimes that they can touch. But God's saying, I don't want you to have anything that, that you can see. And I, I think I've got a good illustration from Adam for you on that. But so one of the things that I found out recently from another book by Adam Hamilton is the Egyptian temple that they would have was basically the same blueprint that God gave to Moses for what the tabernacle and then later the temple was supposed to be like. You've got an outer court, you've got an inner court, you've got a holy place in the Holy of Holies where there's like this throne room. And in the Egyptian ones, a lot of times it would be Pharaoh or some previous Pharaoh sitting on the throne. You can Google this stuff. Uh, sometimes there's four of these gods sitting on the throne. And at first I was like, why would God copy something that the Israelites would associate with kind of like pagan worship? But the difference was the Ark of the Covenant right up front with the angels the same way that the Egyptians would have something like that. There was nothing there. It wasn't Moses sitting there. It wasn't Pharaoh. It wasn't King David. It was God himself. It's called the mercy seat. God was present. I used to always think he was in the box. He was right above it. But you can't try to make a picture of it. So have you ever had a photo of you uh, that you really don't like and people go, that is the best picture of you. I hate when that happens. It's like, that's what I look like? I thought I looked like that. And they're like, no, that's not what you look like. Do you realize that you have never seen yourself as other people do? What do I mean by that? You only see yourself in two dimensions. That's all you've ever seen. Whether it's a photograph, whether it's in the mirror. Other people see us in three dimensions which means other people see us a little bit better than we see ourselves. Let me tell you a story. Winston Churchill was uh, going to celebrate his 80th birthday in 1954. And so they commissioned this guy, Graham Sutherland, to do a portrait of him for Parliament. They're going to hang it in Parliament. And so he does this, this portrait. And it was hailed by some, and others were disgusted by it. Disgusted. So what did Winston Churchill think about it? He was deeply disappointed. It's not who he believed himself to be. What did Lady Churchill think of it? She cut it into pieces and she burned it. It never made it to Parliament. I think that is the best illustration I've come across of why God doesn't want us to draw pictures of who he is, make images, because nothing would do it justice. Nothing could possibly do it justice in three dimensions. Because God is more than three dimensions. And yet the Bible tells us that Jesus is God's image. Jesus bore the image of God perfectly for us. So let's take a look at Colossians chapter 1. So I think this is, this is really good stuff. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So we don't get to see him, but we get to hear his words, and we get to see the kinds of things that he did. And he existed before anything was created in his supreme overall creation. That's uh, 
Colossians 1.15, and then in 1.19 it says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. So Jesus is the perfect picture, the perfect picture of God. You see, it has to be something that God made that would represent God, not something that human beings could make. But there's another image bearer. First I want to read from chapter 1 of Colossians. Later it says, For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too, and this is the secret, Christ lives in you. Or as another version says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says, God made the mountains, he made the oceans, and we see the beauty and the glory of God there and the stars. But there's only one other place other than Jesus where we might encounter the image of God. And that's in another human being. Think about that for a moment. That person that cut you off today, the person that was, was taking too much time in the checkout line, that's the only other place where you really might encounter the image of God. It's fallen, it's broken, but God's restoring it. And I just heard a great message on, it was, I think it was Mark Job, heard him on the radio today, giving a great message about that. In Christ, he is restoring us to become more and more like Jesus so that we might love and we might bring beauty to this broken world. Have you ever had your identity stolen? I've had my credit card compromised too many times. For so long I've had the number memorized and then, you know, after 15 years, then somebody else gets their mitts on it and you get these calls you know, from Visa. It's like, did you just buy some furniture in London? It's like, I don't think so. I'll check with my wife, but uh, she's here in Wheaton. I don't think so. Adam Hamilton says that on Facebook on a regular basis, he gets hacked and that people set up an account, say that it's him. And, you know, they, they play along pretty nice for a while. But then the, the, the thing normally is that they're wanting to get money for missions in Africa. And he says most people don't fall for it because um, this stilted English that these people use. And also, I've noticed like a lot of misspelled words and things like that. But uh, he really dislikes it. Why? Because people are misusing his name. You know, when the Bible says don't misuse the name of the Lord, and a lot of people do it, and I'd encourage you not to in the way that we often think of, just like using it as a cuss word. But but any way of misusing it, carry, treating God's name like it was something to just throw around or whatever. But do you like it when somebody misuses your name and your identity and your character? No, that's what, that's what Adam Hamilton's saying. He, he really dislikes that. And I think God dislikes that too when we misrepresent him. Thinking about Facebook, I have a friend, his name's Everett, and I'm friends with him three times over. I, I know not all three of those are really him, but I just don't give money to any of the Everett's that ask me for anything. Yeah, Facebook, interesting. Facebook, thanks for carrying our messages. I really appreciate that. So no one could follow all 10 of the commands, and we'll, we'll come back, we'll touch on them, and I hope in a creative, redemptive way in the weeks to come, but I think of Moses, you know, carrying those commands down and just realizing, yikes, I'm a murderer. And they all know it. I'm going to present this new covenant to them with all these things. And when I, when I read the murder part to them, I wonder what they're going to think. I think they're going to realize that Moses, their leader, is one more person in need of grace and mercy from God, just the same way that they are. But what a beautiful world it would be if everyone followed all 10 of the commands all the time just for starters. So why? Why did God create a world where people wouldn't be able to live up to it? When I was in college, I memorized a number of Bible verses, and one of them was Romans eleven thirty-two, 32. And it said, for God consigned, but this, we don't normally use that terminology, so I'll use the NLT. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience. God created a world where everyone would mess up at some point. Everybody. And Ten Commandments alone. There's no one who's kept all of them. And there's a few other areas where God would have some things to say. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so he could have mercy on everyone. God created a world that mercy would be as important as the oxygen that we breathe. 
that we would receive it, that we would learn to share it with other people, that it's, it's not some religious right, or it's, it's what we need. We need it from God and others need it from us. Universal disobedience and universal mercy is offered. You know, the only reason that some people don't like the idea of mercy is there has to be an admonition of guilt. So the new covenant, how did Jesus love? How did Jesus seek to mend this broken world? He could have used a couple of ways. Force, come with the angels. This time, <laughs> you're not going to eat from the fruit. You're going to obey. No, that's not how he did it. Manipulation, I'll trick them. I'll promise them something that'll make them really want to be good. No. How about more rules? No, Jesus really reduced all the rules to love God and love other people and then love as I love you. How about inspiration? Yeah, yeah, inspiration. If you can look at the cross and then recognize what all of it means and every year we go through Good Friday and I think I understand a little bit better. But yeah, inspiration. How about transformation? Yeah, absolutely. Jesus came to transform because the problem with Adam and Eve wasn't just what they did, it's what they became. It's what they were on the inside. And so God needs to change this from the inside out. But this really struck me this week. Logically, what, how, Jesus came and he changed one person at a time. If you've watched any of The Chosen, you'll see that. And I think it portrays it as powerfully as probably anything I've seen in, in media. He did it one person at a time. So what logical difference could Jesus think he was making as far as winning the world back into relation with, with himself, with his Father and the Holy Spirit? Could Jesus have possibly thought he was making a difference with really 11 fo followers and a couple handful of, of women who followed around and, and helped support them? He really couldn't have. But you know what? One by one, this is how he does it. One by one, he woos us. He says, come back to the garden. That's all he's ever wanted from the very beginning. And that's what got messed up. And he couldn't give up on, on this, this humanity that he created. He couldn't force us. He couldn't coerce us. And so he woos us. He says, come, come back to the garden. I just, I just want to be with you. I've shared this before. And every once in a while, I'll be spending some time reading and praying. And then I'll get up like I'm rushing to go somewhere and I'll just, I'll just feel like Jesus just says, why don't you just stay? Just stay for a little bit. No, no agenda. Believe me, I stay when I sense God saying that. And you know what? I think, I think that's his heart every day. One by one, he woos us back to the garden so we can walk in the cool breezes. You know, I've walked in some really cool places, national parks. Not just here in Canada, Mongolia. Um, the idea of actually being with Jesus in a beautiful setting like that, the Garden of Eden. You know, as I was wrapping up the message, I remembered an old song by Bread. And here's the real simple lyric, and I just thought, wow, that was Jesus. I would give anything I own. I'd give up my life, my heart, my home. I would give everything I own just to have you back again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe that in, in the heart of this message today is your heart, that you want people back in relationship, not to follow rules, not to follow regulations. It broke your heart when Adam and Eve hid from you. The same way it breaks our heart when someone we love doesn't want to be with us anymore. We get that. There's not one of us that doesn't understand that kind of rejection. But Father, you've experienced it from the beginning of creation. Help us to be the kind of people that don't hide away. And that's where Moses is such, a, such an inspiration to me. He had one request. It wasn't wisdom. It was he wanted to see you. I, I, I think that had to be one of your happiest days. When someone just says, I want to see you. I want to be with you. And for each here today, it doesn't matter where they are, if they would say, Lord, I, I just, I want to see you today. I want to be with you. I know I can't see you, see you, but I want to. Lord, I, I just pray you'd use this message today for your, your purposes. Draw people into relationship with you. That's what you've wanted from the beginning. Pray it in Jesus' name for his kingdom's sake. Amen. Mm -hmm.
glad you could join us today. Uh, it's always a, a privilege. It, it really is to be able to share God's Word. Uh, for me to be able to do something that I love and almost every week I hear from somebody out there that I had no idea was, was tuning in. Um, love to hear from you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.